Good afternoon. Uh, this is Linda Cavallo Murphy uh, from the Carlisle Council on Aging. I just want to thank you all for joining us on this lovely spring day. And we welcome Barry Pell once again to Carlisle virtually. Um, as many of you um, during this last month, uh, Barry Pell is a world traveler and photojournalist. He has traveled widely over five decades, visiting and documenting landscapes and cultures in nearly 170 countries on all continents. Mr. Pell has also lived and traveled in China, Eastern Europe, North Africa, and South Africa. I'm oh, sorry, sorry, did I say that? South America, I'm sorry. He currently lectures on international cultures at schools, universities, libraries, and community centers in the Boston area. And as I mentioned a little bit ago, um, many of you were with us about a month ago um, when Barry led us on an exciting expedition to Antarctica. And today um, he'll be taking us to the Galapagos, Enchanted Islands of the Pacific. Uh, Barry will take questions at the end of the lecture. So if you could use the, func chat, um, the chat function, uh, that would be very helpful. And without further ado, here's Barry. Thank you very much, Linda, for that introduction. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for attending this armchair travel program to the Galapagos Islands. And the Galapagos are a group of volcanic islands that are located some 600 miles west of the South American continent. Islands that you might say are practicing by their distance, their own geologic manner of social distancing. Well, it's indeed the isolation of these islands in the Pacific Ocean that created over time a natural laboratory. And in that laboratory of these islands evolved unique plants and animals that are found nowhere else on our planet. And which led the naturalist Charles Darwin on his visit to the islands in the early 1800s to use his observations as a model for developing his later theory of natural selection and evolution. Now in this program, based on my travels, I'll introduce you to many of the very special and unique animals that live in the Galapagos. And I'll explain about the different climates and topographies that these animals have adapted to in order to survive and thrive in their own ecological niche. I'll also discuss some of the history of the island's early discovery and exploration and how my wife and I travel to explore these lands. And finally, I'll discuss how the Galapagos are being very much impacted by the onslaught of tourism and what is being done to protect the land and the animals in what is a very fragile environment. Now, it's also important to note in this time of COVID that although the isolation of the Galapagos has shielded it to some extent from infection, the islands have been devastated in part because their hospitals are not equipped for treatment, but especially because of the economic collapse with huge unemployment and shutdown of food shipments from the mainland that the population depends on. And so residents have had to make urgent changes, such as, for example, growing vegetables at home. The islands, of course, are famously known as the land of evolution. And as the animals have adapted, so too it appears that humans have had to adapt to these changing times. Hotels are empty, scientific work has stopped, and it's unclear when tourism will resume. Well, let's first take a look at a map of the islands. And uh, here we have on the uh, top of the screen, we have a, a map showing the relative location of the Galapagos uh, to the South American continent, uh, the Galapagos being about 600 miles west of the uh, western side of the continent and uh, about on the equator. Uh, there are 18 major islands and the majority of those islands are shown at the bottom of the map in this enlargement. And during uh, my travels, I visited about uh, nine, eight or nine of the islands, uh, many of which have uh, their own unique populations of birds and animals. 
Okay, so let's shift over to the photos. All right. Well, during his travel circumnavigating the world in the 1830s on a ship called the HMS Beagle, the British naturalist Charles Darwin, when he was uh, only in his mid 20s, he visited the Galapagos Islands. He came on this ship, which was the HMS Beagle, a replica of it now sits in a uh, town in the south of Chile. And to his amazement, Darwin discovered a menagerie of flora and creatures that he was completely unfamiliar with, and they were not found anywhere else in his experience. This is one of those creatures I'll be speaking about later called the red-footed booby. Well, animals were so, so unlike what his experience was, like this marine iguana. And the other thing he noticed was that they showed no fear of approaching Darwin. Birds like this Galapagos flycatcher even flew and stayed right on his shoulders. Well, these islands, he concluded, were truly a world within itself. And this is a Nazca booby with its young chick. Well, Darwin completed his circumnavigation of the world on the HMS Beagle. He went home and he thought about uh, everything that he had seen and he used his observations over the next two decades to develop his theory of natural selection, which essentially says that useful biological variations that facilitate survival are preserved and eventually they break off to form new species. This is a blue-footed booby. I'll be speaking more about that bird as well. Well, the Galapagos belongs to Ecuador and Ecuadorians are proud of Darwin's association with the islands that led to his famous findings. And today, as you uh, travel around the Galapagos and even on mainland Ecuador, you will encounter busts and statues and streets named after Darwin, research centers, and even a number of species of birds that commemorate him. Well, the Galapagos, as I mentioned, uh, are a group of islands that lie off the Pacific coast of South America, about 600 miles west of Ecuador and straddle the equator. There are 18 major island group islands uh, and over, in addition to that, about 100 rocks and tiny island, islands spread over a width of about 140 miles. The islands were originally discovered by the Spanish uh, on their uh, work and uh, exploration and plundering of the new world in South America back in 1535. But in the early years, uh, the Spanish were much more interested in finding gold in the mainland of South America than exploring these islands and they left them alone. They basically left them to British buccaneers and pirates and whalers who roamed the archipelago's waters and those early British mariners named the islands originally after English royalty that they were familiar with, names like Charles and familiar places like Abramall and Narborough. Well, it wasn't until the late 1700s that the Spanish mounted a scientific expedition which uh, to investigate the islands and that coincided with the growth of a whaling industry to meet the rising demand for whale oil. Well, the whales around uh, during the 17th and 18th centuries, the whales around the Galapagos, the whale population was nearly decimated by this whale trade. Uh, populations, of course, nowadays are protected and have bounced back. There are over 20 species that have been identified roaming the waters of uh, the Galapagos. And here are the bleached skeletal, partial skeletal remains of a whale that had washed up on the beach. Now, during the uh, early period of uh, whaling and Spanish exploration, a lot of the ships uh, that came uh, to these waters arrived from Europe, principally from uh, Britain. And those journeys might last two or three years. And during that time, sailors had no way of being in contact with their families back home. And so a tradition grew up whereby in one particular spot, a place called Post Office Bay 
on Floriana Island, all of these mariners would at some point stop. And a barrel was placed at the bay where sailors could leave mail to be collected by ships that were homeward bound. And uh, in this way, a, a kind of mail service was created whereby mariners who were going to be away for several years would be able to get news back to their hometown and their loved ones. Well, in modern commemoration of this early post office, there is a barrel there today where visitors uh, who uh, stop at Post Office Bay on Floriana Island can leave addressed postcards that can then be retrieved by subsequent visitors to personally deliver when they return home. No stamp required. Well, after Ecuador secured its independence from Spain in 1822, it then annexed the islands and changed their names from the British names to official Spanish names. And so the islands then got names like Española or Fernandina and Floriana. And so today, many of the islands are a little confusingly known by two sets of names, Spanish and English. Now the Galapagos are much different islands in the Pacific than many visitors expect who perhaps are thinking about the, uh, the uh, uh, very flowered islands, the beautiful uh, lush islands of the South Pacific. Well, the Galapagos are not that. They are basically desert islands with three different habitats that each are suited to different species of plants and animals. And that's what enables them to thrive in their own separate environment. So let me describe those three zones. First of all, there is a narrow coastal band, which is along the sea, where you will find a topography that looks like this, evergreen plants and mangroves in quiet lagoons. And these are favored by birds like brown pelicans that nest in the low bushes. Uh, although many of these pelicans, uh, and we'll talk about this later, also somehow got, uh, were attracted or also attracted to hang out in the local fish market, sort of a competition between the natural and the man-made environment. Well, the second habitat is at the other end, on the middle of these islands. Some of the islands are quite high, as high as a mile high. And at the tops of the islands, there is relatively more rainfall, cooler temperatures. And this band at the top is favored by animals like the giant tortoises shown here as a place to cool off. Now, the giant tortoises will often walk long distances to get to these cooling off places, and they travel across the terrain on well-worn paths that are referred to as tortoise highways. And signs are posted from time to time warning we humans to stay out of the tortoise highway paths. So you have this, this path along the water circling each of the islands. You have the high point, which is cooler up at the top, and then the middle zone, which is the largest on these islands, is quite dry and arid. That is the most prevalent. It is filled with cacti and dry grasses and trees such as this, the acacia tree. And this is the typical terrain, the most predominant terrain, that is encountered by visitors. And as I say, many visitors are su surprised that the Galapagos are not filled with lush tropical foliage. But it is within this arid zone that live some of the most distinctive and numerous species of plants and, island and animals in the Galapagos, like for example, this stocky and compact yellow-crowned night heron with its uh, delicate feathers extending behind its head. So now it is not only the geographic distance of the islands from continental South America, but also the geology of how the islands were formed that has produced its rare biology. So the Galapagos were formed not by breaking away from the mainland of South America, as many islands are formed, but rather by from the tops of submerged volcanoes that rose directly out of the sea. And so the islands were never attached to the South American continent. Now, once the red hot lava of these volcanic eruptions uh, started to cool to form rock, 
the sterile land masses slowly became colonized by hardy plants and animals that arrived uh, on ocean currents, uh, uh, perhaps blown there over distances, perhaps coming by ship as stowaways, and they managed to establish themselves. Like for example, this spotted lava lizard of which there are seven endemic species spread out around the islands and they grow to about a foot in length. Now the seismic and volcanic activity that originally formed the islands is still occurring. And the Galapagos Archipelago is considered one of the world's most volcanically active areas. Four volcanoes have erupted since 2005, which when the lava cools has left fantastical shapes of twisted and very artistic looking, I think, lava flows. Well, let's speak about some of those unique animals. The best known of uh, the Galapagos animals probably is this one, the giant tortoise. Indeed, the very name Galapago is an old Spanish word meaning saddle, and it refers to the distinctive saddle-like shell of some of the tortoises. The lumbering and reclusive Galapagos tortoises can weigh over 600 pounds. They can live for more than 100 years making them the longest living vertebrae on land. A Galapagos tortoise uh, that died in 2006 was dated from its shell rings to the age of 175 and was the last known animal, therefore, interestingly, that would have been alive when Darwin visited the islands in the early 1800s. Now, by the way, there is a distinction in English designation between tortoises, which generally refers to the land-dwelling species like this, and <clears throat> turtles, shown here, which are often restricted in reference to aquatic environments. Well, there are about 1,400 green sea turtles living in the Galapagos waters. Now, they spend most of their lives in the water, but the females will crawl ashore at night and dig nests on sand above the high water mark to deposit a clutch of anywhere upwards of 200 ping pong ball sized eggs. Now the landing tracks, you can always tell when a uh, turtle has come up on the land to deposit its eggs. You can see these sort of carved out of the sand on the beach during the breeding season. Now, when the eggs hatch, they have lots of predators. There are birds and pigs and insects that go after them and dig them up. So they need to be buried well under the sand by their mother. Even in the water, once they hatch and they're just uh, tiny turtles, they can be attacked by sharks and frigate birds that prey upon them. And as a result, although 200 eggs seems like a lot, very few of them survive. Now, from an evolutionary standpoint, nature attempts to produce many more young than predators can eat, the, thereby ensuring at least some offspring will hatch and grow into the next generation. Now, one of my most memorable experience was snorkeling off the beach and swimming within arm's length of one of these nearly three foot long, 350 pound, very gentle vertebrates, their small legs gently paddling just below the water's surface. Well, let's get back to the land-based giant tortoises. Herman Melville, the famed author of Moby Dick, he also visited the Galapagos around the same time as Darwin was there. And of the giant tortoises, he remarked, quote, behold these really wondrous tortoises, black as widower's weeds, heavy, as chests of plate with vast shells, medallion and orbed like shields. These mystic creatures affected me in a manner not easy to unfold. Well, there are about a dozen tortoise species, subspecies in the Galapagos, and all of them evolved from common ancestors that arrived from mainland South America. Now, how they got there was by swimming and floating on the ocean currents. Now, this may seem like an incredible journey across 600 miles, but it's known that Galapagos tortoises can float easily in water. And nature was obviously prodding them on to look for food and drew them to these islands. Now, 
they were able to breathe because they could extend their necks above the water. And they're also animals that are able to survive months without fresh food or water. Now that enabled them to make this huge journey, but it was also, as I'll describe, nearly a res uh, resulted in their extinction. Well, the giant size of the tortoises is another example of natural selection or survival of the fittest, since it was the larger tortoises that could hold their heads a greater height above the water and breathe. And in addition, they had more fat reserves to survive long ocean crossings. Now, the early history of the Galapagos is indeed a sad one, having suffered badly at the hands of humans. Originally, these tortoises numbered in the Galapagos some 250,000 in the early 16th century, but they reached a low, their population was decimated. By the 1970s, there were only 3,000 or so remaining. They disappeared entirely on some of the islands. It is because the tortoises could remain alive without fresh food or water for up to a year that sailors who were restricted to a diet of biscuits and salted pork, and this is before refrigeration, they would capture as many as 100,000 tortoises for food through the 1800s. And the animals then could be kept on the ships. They provided dependable, tasty, fresh protein. They never had to be fed. They never had to be watered. And when the sailors were hungry, they could just take one and kill it for food. They were also hunted for the oil in their bodies that was used for fuel, not to mention being collected as oddities and put into private collections and museums back in Europe. Certainly their large size and slow movement made them easy to capture. Well, in addition, the whalers and sealers and colonizers who first came to the Galapagos they brought with them animals that they were familiar with from Europe, animals like goats and pigs, donkeys, and even rats, which stowed away on their ships. And these animals entered onto the land and they multiplied and they became competitors with the tortoises for grazing land. They damaged the tortoise nests. They ate the tortoise eggs and babies. Tortoises had no protection, no defense against these unknown predators. In fact, on the Galapagos, the only natural predator to the Galapagos tortoise is this bird, a Galapagos hawk, which uh, indeed does look kind of fierce that it could do some major damage to a tortoise. Uh, they in fact are quite tame, however. When we encountered them, they even landed on some of our group's shoulders and, and heads um, and uh, they, uh, they are though the only natural predator. But so the tortoises were, populations were decimated for many, many reasons. Um, nowadays, of course, the Galapagos giant tortoise is strictly protected by the Ecuadorian government and international agreements. And as I say, the populations are starting to return. And there are also programs to hunt and eradicate non-native animal predators, such as the goats and dogs but uh, it seems an endless process as these uh, non-endemic species are difficult to uh, capture and uh, eliminate entirely. The Charles Darwin Research Station was established on one of the islands, Santa Cruz in the 1960s to conduct scientific research and to promote environmental education. And one of its principal activities is a breeding and rearing program for tortoises. Tortoises are indeed vegetarian. They're kept in captivity for four to five years when they're born so as to reach a size with a much better chance of survival in the wild. And then they are released onto native landscapes. And so it's estimated today from a reduction down to only about uh, 3,000 of these uh, tortoises in the 1970s, their population has rebounded. There are some 19,000 now uh, on the islands, although the species is still uh, classified as vulnerable. Now, while the giant tortoise undoubtedly is the archipelago's most celebrated animal, the Galapagos Islands are also home to hundreds of fascinating plants and insects like this colorful 
Galapagos grasshopper, birds like this oyster catcher, which feeds on crustaceans and is able to break open crab shells with their pointy beaks, as well as the presence of mammal and fish species on land, uh, as well as a wealth of uh, animals and fish underwater. I mentioned the turtles, as well as this, the spotted eagle ray. Well, these beautiful flat fish, often known as leopard rays because of the uh, spots on their skins, propel themselves very gracefully in the water, rather like flying underwater. And they often can be encountered swimming in schools. Well, nowhere else than these Galapagos is there such a collection of incredible creatures like these colorful marine iguanas. And it's also possible because they are so tame to walk within arm's reach of a blue-footed booby pictured here that has blue webs for feet or to encounter close up sea lions sunning on the shore. Well, 30% of the marine life in the surrounding seas is endemic. That is species found nowhere else on our planet as are roughly one third of the island's land plants. Nearly all of its reptiles, like this different species of lava lizard than the one I showed you before, almost half of its bird species, including this Galapagos mockingbird. And among the more unique species is a marine iguana shown here, found only in the Galapagos. It is the world's only lizard with the ability to feed underwater in the sea for long periods of time. Let's talk about some of these lizards. Well, perhaps the most famous is this prehistoric looking Galapagos land iguana. It is a species of lizard. They grow to a length of some three to five feet and have a body weight of about 25 pounds. Now Darwin, when he was in the Galapagos, he encountered them and he wrote about them. And I, I felt as I read some of his writings, they seemed very unscientific because he described them quite subjectively as, quote, ugly animals with a singularly stupid appearance. Well, to me, they didn't uh, appear quite so stupid. They actually seemed to have a permanent smile. Being cold-blooded, they uh, will absorb heat from the sun by basking on volcanic rock. At night, they sleep in burrows to conserve their body heat. Now, we were often able to locate them in the morning when we went out to hike, uh, not by uh, finding them, but seeing evidence of them from their heavy long tails as they made their way to their overnight burrows. The iguanas enjoy a symbiotic relationship with birds, as many of the animals have these dual relationships. And that is, in this case, the birds that land on the backs of the iguanas remove parasites and ticks which provides relief to the iguanas while at the same time providing food for the birds. Now the Galapagos land iguanas are vegetarian. They feed primarily on this plant, the prickly pear cactus. Now the marine iguanas, also lizards, are believed to have evolved to split away as a separate species from land iguanas some eight to 10 million years ago. And they are found commonly along that coastline uh, zone that I mentioned in describing the different zones of the Galapagos. And they can, as I mentioned, dive into the water as deep as 30 feet and feed on seaweed and algae on underwater rocks. Now, of course, lizards uh, are, cannot breathe underwater since they don't have gills, but nature has enabled them in order to get their food has enabled them to hold their breath for an impressive amount of time upwards of an hour. Now, in addition, the normal color of marine iguanas is black through most of the year and that enables them to absorb the heat of the sun better uh, being cold blooded. It also enables them, they live along the coast and where there is a lot of uh, volcanic lava, which is black and enables their black color enables them some camouflage from other predators to spread their bodies out on the black lava rock and uh, expose as much of their skin to the sun's rays. However, 
During the mating season for these marine iguanas, which is from January to March, the male marine iguanas take on a very attractive, clearly attractive to females, attractive deep red or even a turquoise coloration, quite pretty, which advertises their eagerness to mate. Now males are very territorial. They will set up territories above the high tide mark on rocks and they fiercely fight over them. Uh, nature has also provided a, uh, an appearance of these uh, iguanas with these uh, scaly looking uh, backs, which give the impression of being fierce and uh, dangerous to contend with among their male rivals, but in fact, uh, they're mostly for show. Now, once the breeding season ends, the hormones wane and the iguanas then return to their ashy black coloration. Well, let me tell you a little bit about how we traveled around the islands. A small number of people who come to the Galapagos will base themselves in a hotel on one of the islands and then take day trips on small outboard motorcraft to visit uh, perhaps the closest islands or investigate in more detail the island that they're staying on. But that's not typical and it's not the best way to see the range of plants and animals that are in the Galapagos. Rather, the majority of people will uh, book passage on a, uh, a, a ship like this one, um, which, held, uh, which holds anywhere between 18 and say 24 passengers, and then uh, go from island to island and make uh, journeys, make uh, excursions onto each of the different islands to see the different habitats that the uh, different plants and animals are thriving on. Uh, this was our ship, the Galavan. It was 20 passengers and we would sleep on the ship and take our meals on board. And so our uh, uh, daily routine typically was to uh, sail uh, overnight from island to island. In the morning after breakfast, we would have a, uh, an excursion, which we would make to the islands on these 10 passenger Zodiac rafts. Uh, these rafts tied to the back of our ship, when not in use, uh, sometimes were also very popular with the local wildlife. And we would use these rafts to hike out to uh, different environments that we encountered on the islands. And they could be rough volcanic lava that we would walk along, uh, or sandy beaches, or occasionally rocky vegetated trails. And our landings on these islands from the zodiac rafts would either be a dry landing where we would step directly from the raft onto shore or a wet landing where the raft could not approach immediately on the land, but we had to wade through uh, perhaps uh, three or four feet uh, of length, uh, a shallow water to get onto the land and begin our, uh, our walk along the islands. We were divided into uh, two groups. We were led by a naturalist guide for one to two hour hikes, some of which uh, indeed were strenuous, steep and rocky and facilitated by a walking stick. Most of the paths were fairly level. Occasionally there were some steep and rocky climbs from the raft up to the beginning of the cliffside trail, which would then be pretty level. Now, when we got to the top of the trail, occasionally a representative of the local wildlife appeared to want to greet us and join us on our hike. Now, on most days, our outings were also accompanied by some snorkeling to see the uh, life in the water, either directly from the beach or jumping out of our zodiac raft in deeper water. And then when we returned to the ship for midday uh, rest and lunch, uh, there were many picture guidebooks to help us identify the birds, fish, and animals that we'd encounter. And then in the afternoon, we would um, go out for another excursion to a different part of that island, or perhaps to a nearby island. Now, certainly photography was a priority. And much as I'd like to boast that getting close-up detailed pictures required amazing feats of physical dexterity, in fact, the animals and nearly all the birds in the Galapagos are quite amazing in that they were very accommodating and were either indifferent to our presence 
or seemed to actually enjoy posing for the camera. Well, stepping onto wave-washed lava shorelines, we were usually met by a menagerie of sh uh, shiny-skinned sea lions or sunning marine iguanas like this, head-nodding lava lizards, birds like this mockingbird that fearlessly took a drink from my hand, and uh, others like the intensely bright red Sally Lightfoot crab, so named for their agility to jump and climb vertical slopes. All of these creatures seemed amazingly comfortable in close proximity, not only with each other of different species, but even with us. Well, nearly all the islands have spectacular fine white or red sand beaches, often occupied by sea lions heading to and from the water to swim, to frolic or fish, or rest on the beach. Well, if this is all sounding like a kind of animal garden of Eden, you probably wouldn't be far off in that estimation. Well, the Galapagos became something of an Eden for some human families as well in the early 20th century, but with sinister results. And that is in the early 20th century, there were two German families post-World War I, who were looking to escape the turmoil of Europe. And they decided to move and settle on one of the islands that was uninhabited, Floriana Island. These couples, these two German couples who were, did not know of each other's presence uh, until they arrived there, they were eccentric to the extreme. And that is one of the couples knowing that dental care would be impossible prudently removed all their teeth and made a single set of stainless steel dentures to share between them. Well, you have two couples living on a large island. As you perhaps would be surprised to learn, they didn't get along. And when a self-proclaimed baroness in tow with her two lovers arrived a few years later, the situation became dramatically worse. There followed a series of strange events which culminated in several mysterious deaths and disappearances of some of these human residents, leaving only one survivor of the saga. Well, this woman died in the year 2000. She still lived on Floriana Island up to the age of 96. This bizarre and unique story has been related. It's well known in books, and there is even a fascinating documentary film, if any of you are interested in titled The Galapagos Affair, Satan Comes to Eden. And by the way, the uh, whiskered sea lions that I've shown are different than seals. So sea lions, as this picture shows, have the ability to walk on land using their large flippers. They're able to gallop and even can outrun a person on rocky terrain. Well, this together with their loud bark would keep us vigilant and especially careful not to come between a parent and a baby pup. Well, in contrast, seals like this have small flippers. They're able to move on land only by wriggling on their bellies. They cannot walk. Sea lions are superbly, superbly adapted to their aquatic lifestyle with excellent underwater vision. And they have evolved directional underwater hearing which also enables them to locate their prey. Now let's talk about these birds that are uh, so popular in the Galapagos that everybody wants to see, especially this one, the blue-footed booby. There are some 180 bird species in the islands of which 29 are not found anywhere else in the world. Uh, among them are the uh, great blue heron, shown here with its uh, long spindly legs, which typically lives on the coastal zone and nests in the coastal mangroves. Now, part of the attraction of birds to the Galapagos is that the, topo the topography of the islands provides this range that I've described of different habitats. The elevations are different, the moisture and precipitation, the temperature is different in each of these zones. And thus within each habitat, different birds have found their own ecological niche where they can thrive. 
Well, the appeal of viewing birds in the Galapagos environment also lies in their tameness. This is the swallow-tailed gull with its bright red ring encircling the eyes. It was quite remarkable to us that we were able to approach to within a few feet, birds like this Nazca booby sitting on eggs or involved in elaborate courtship rituals without affecting their behavior whatsoever. Now, because the islands are tropical most of the year, there is little or reduced seasonality of breeding. So visitors can see various species breeding during any month that they visit. And the weather is quite accommodating. Let's talk about these seabird boobies in the Galapagos, so well known. There are three species living there. They're the blue-footed, the red-footed, and the Nazca. These are the Nazca boobies. This is the red-footed booby. The name booby, where does that come from? Well, it's derived from the Spanish slang bobo, meaning stupid. It is said to have been named by 16th century Spanish sailors who easily caught and ate the birds when they naively landed on ship masts. Now the blue-footed booby in particular is one of the island's most sought after birds to see. Not because it is so rare, because it isn't, but because it is entertaining. Now, both the males and females get certain pigments in their diet which make their feet blue. Now, during courtship, which is what's going on here, the male booby is on the right, the female is on the left, a male booby will conduct a foot raising dance. You can see it going on right here in order to impress. This apparently is very impressive. You could see how the female is being extremely attentive to this foot raising of the male. And if attracted, a female will come to join him and together they will dance what could only be referred to as the booby two-step. Well, if all goes well, the dance peaks in mutual upward head pointing, face to face and culminates in mating. Now, males with brighter feet appear to be more successful at securing a mate than those with dull feet. So foot color appears to be a sexually selected trait. And research has shown that the blueness of a male booby's feet is a reliable indicator of its health. So having brighter blue feet signifies that an individual is stronger and healthier and therefore a potentially better mate. Studies have even shown that the brighter the blue feet means that the father, the paternal contribution to raising offspring will be stronger. Now, the, I mentioned that these uh, birds survive because they have different traits that then don't compete with each other. And for example, the boobies are an example of this. Blue-footed boobies make their nests on the ground. In contrast, red-footed boobies will make their nests in the trees. So again, they're not competing. And so here we have a red-footed booby collecting twigs to fly up to a tree and to make its nest in the tree. Now, to enable that, rather than having flat feet that the blue-footed boobies have, nature has enabled the red-footed boobies to have these toes that can curl around and grab onto tree branches, essential if you're going to make a nest in the trees. And then there are the mask boobies. Mask boobies will lay two eggs each year, but only ever raise one chick because there is not enough food for two chicks to survive. And what has nature done to enable this? Well, the eggs are laid a few days apart, which give the first chick a distinct advantage over the second. As soon as the second chick hatches, its strong sibling attacks it and pushes it out of the nest and kills it. This sibling murder is known biologically as the Cain and Abel syndrome. And it is another of nature's adaptations since, as I say, Nazca booby parents cannot bring in enough food to feed two healthy birds. Well, another rather common but unique looking seabird is this one, the frigate bird. 
Now these uh, birds were quite impressive. They're highly maneuverable and acrobatic flyers. They have enormous wingspans. They're uh, very uh, fun to watch, very picturesque, quite beautiful. Uh, deeply forked tails, and they would soar around and perch on our ship. They were one of the first birds we saw on our approach to the islands. Their greatest distinction, though, occurs during breeding. And that is, when ready to breed, the male frigate bird will pump air into its grossly exaggerated bright red throat pouch until it is the size of, uh, say, a party balloon. As soon as an adult female of his species flies by, he will erupt into fits of rapturous head shaking and uttering a shrill high pitched cry. And if this is enough to impress the female, she will alight beside him and the pair bond is sealed. Well, finally, a word about the birds which Darwin used to develop his theory of evolution. And they are called finches. In fact, they've been, the finches have been named after uh, Darwin. They're called Darwin's finches. They provided evidence for his theory of natural selection on his uh, work, which uh, ultimately uh, was, was written uh, several decades later, called On the Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection. Well, in this <laughs> revolutionary work, Darwin proposed that species change in response to their environment. And uh, as far as the finches are concerned, they expanded in species to uh, over a dozen different species of birds based on their need to find food for their survival. So let me explain. So for example, among the Darwin's finches, Darwin noticed that the beaks of these birds varied in size from small to medium to large beaks. And those beaks are then able to find food seeds to crack that are either small seeds, medium-sized seeds, or large seeds. So the correspondence of those seed sizes as food for the finches then enabled or created the different species. In addition, some of these birds were better suited to find seeds and crack them for food on the ground. Some are better cracking seeds that are on the trees. And so there are ground finches and there are tree finches. In addition to that, some finches are better suited to finding food in some of the cactus fruit. So yet another species evolved. So from one species of finch, these more than a dozen different kinds of finches, a couple of dozen actually, different types of finches eventually evolved, which are separate in their, in their sustainability requirements for the seeds that they find. All right. Well, as a place of outstanding universal value, the Galapagos Islands were the first World Heritage Site designated by the United Nations. This was back in 1978. By, nine, by 2007, however, the popularity of these islands brought a much less desirable designation. It became listed on the World Heritage Sites in danger. Well, following Ecuador's improved efforts to protect the archipelago's unique biodiversity, the endangered designation was removed three years later. Yet, the Galapagos Islands remain a very fragile environment. They face continuing challenges from habitat degradation and overuse. Now, I first visited the Galapagos in the 1980s. And at that time, there were about 20,000 annual visitors. The number of visitors in 2017 was more than 10 times that amount, some 230,000 visitors. Until 1969, the only way to visit the islands was on a private or chartered vessel. Today, there are two airports and some 85 cruise yachts are licensed for sleep aboard multi-day tours. There are many land-based hotels that have been expanding. Uh, in the past, uh, in the decade between 2006 and 2017, hotels in the Galapagos have increased from 65 to nearly, 200, uh, nearly 320. Back in 1960, the human residents on the island were fewer than 3,000. 
Today, the number exceeds 25,000, despite the fact that the human population is limited to only 3% of the land area. Now, Ecuador is trying to limit immigration uh, to, to control the size of the resident population, but there are loopholes and incomplete and inconsistent implementation. Well, the dangers threatening the Galapagos and its animal and water population are varied and many. They include destruction wrought by the introduction of by humans of exotic invasive plants and animals. And as urbanized areas grow, there is more intrusion and impact on the natural habitat and behavior on the animals, as in this example of sea lions being attracted to the local town fish market or taking a nap on a downtown bench. There are yet pressures to open more and more areas to larger cruise ships and more airplanes carrying passengers and requiring ever more infrastructure. There is destruction wrought by careless guests. Well, the Galapagos are known as the enchanted islands. They are for sure an extraordinary archipelago of unrivaled beauty. They are nearly a nearly pristine trove of biodiversity. And one of the most stunning shorebirds is the flamingo. Um, the fragile population has dwindled to less fewer than 500 individuals. Now, Ecuador passed its first laws to protect the animals back in the 1930s. And today these regulations have been expanding. Uh, they include requiring cruise ships to desalinate water on board and to prohibit the disposal of wastes. And tourists are required to receive briefings on the national park regulations before standing out, setting out. But in many ways, environmental protection of the islands is a daunting problem, especially considering that Ecuador is a small, poor nation with limited resources. In 1997, there were with pressure from local residents and mainland Ecuadorian organizations, new laws were passed to address issues such as immigration restriction, eradication of non-native species, and to limit fishing. The Galapagos is now second only to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia in terms of its size of its protected marine area. So the greatest challenge ahead is, I think, to find a balance whereby the presence of humans does not affect negatively this biodiversity, but rather can contribute to its preservation. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? That was wonderful, Barry. Thank you so very much. I think I can speak for everyone that it was uh, awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so if you have questions, you can unmute yourselves or you can also type a question into the chat at the bottom of the screen. Hi, I have a question. Um, first of all, thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation. And we're, we've been wanting to go for a while. Uh, so it's Melissa and Jay. And um, what, so my, my question would be, um, if we want to go scuba diving a little bit, we're just getting recertified after not diving for like 30 years, but uh, have you, did the boat you were on do anything like that? Or did you get in the water or can you make a suggestion about that? Yeah, uh, we didn't. There is scuba diving. Uh, we did uh, no, observe people who were scuba diving. Our boat uh, did not uh, offer that. Uh, we did a lot of snorkeling, uh, but, uh, but no scuba. But I did notice some boats with uh, tanks and uh, with people who were going out and, uh, and doing scuba diving. So it is very, very possible there. Um, and, uh, uh, but I, it's not something that I, I'm familiar with. And for snorkeling, was it with water reasonably comfortable temperature-wise? Oh, wet? absolutely. Oh, yeah, quite. You certainly didn't have to wear a wetsuit or uh, anything like that. It was uh, extremely comfortable. Uh, and um, uh, they provide our boat provided us with uh, with snorkel and uh, flippers. Although we we always bring our own uh, snorkel equipment because it's uh, better fitting to our faces. Uh, but, yeah, that's a good point. And and what month did you go? Uh, we were there in um, in April. And there was enough shallow stuff to look at in snorkels. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Thank you so much. It's really an inspiration. Uh, Barry, that was terrific. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you, do you see any kayaking there? Uh, did not. No, I would imagine it's possible to do. I wouldn't see why it wouldn't be, but we did not see any kayaking. It's not necessary. It's not um, essentially the best way to uh, to visit the islands. I think it would be difficult for kayakers. Uh, I mean, you could have kayaking on a, on a boat and you would go out in the water. It wouldn't enable you to see many uh, of the animals. And I think you need, you, you need to go to visit the Galapagos. You need to get a permit. Uh, which cost $100 per person. And they're all organized by, uh, by these uh, ships um, or hotels. Uh, I, I did not see kayakers there. Uh, we, kayakers wouldn't probably be able to land uh, unless they had somehow managed to be organized in some fashion under the auspices of a uh, regulated company who would then collect the fees for the government. When, when we went to the Galapagos, we, um, the, the boat that we went with um, provided us the opportunity to go uh, kayaking off mm -hmm. of the boat, from the boat. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, as I say, if it was, if it's part of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, cruise that you're on, uh, certainly, but it, I, I don't think somebody could just sort of fly into the islands and go right. kayaking on their own. Um, a comment by someone that it looked as though the outermost toe on the rear foot of the iguanas was canted out at a peculiar angle. Quite interesting. I, that's, uh, that's good powers of observation. I did not specifically notice that, but I, I suspect that that is, uh, enables uh, a better grasp when they are reaching up to uh, feed on some of the prickly pear cactus that they feed on. So I'm, I'm sure that's a biological adaptation that enables better access to their food. Question, how did the original finches arrive on the Galapagos or the, or the other birds for that matter? Well, they, they clearly uh, flew there or they were uh, stowaways along the ships that uh, were on the waters during the early years of exploration and, and whaling that occurred there were the pirate ships that that applied the waters of the Galapagos. And, and that's, how they, that's how they originally arrived. Uh, Barry? Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to know what are the islands that are most visited? When we went 20 years ago, went to Santa Cruz, Floriana, and Santa Fe, because we had three days there before we, we went to the uh, Amazon jungle. Uh, what are the islands that most of the ships are going to now? We were actually yeah. in a very well, small those, boat. Those three are some of them. Uh, Isabella is another one uh, that a lot of people go to. Different, uh, many of the islands have uh, their own unique populations. As I mentioned, these species are adapted to those islands. And so some uh, are, are, have more populations uh, of, of different, different birds and animals. Uh, one of the islands which we did not visit actually has a small population of penguins, which uh, would indeed then be the most northern extent of penguin species on the planet. Uh, we, that is in the western, far western part of the island chain. Um, but uh, um, there are different combinations when if you are organizing uh, or looking on the internet for to select a cruise, there are different combinations of islands which enable you to more or less see different groups of birds and animals, uh, depending on what your particular interests are and also depending on how much time you have. Typically people will visit there for, uh, for eight days or 12 days or some, something in that order enables you to see a good number of the islands and get a, a very good cross section of experience both with the terrain as well as with the animals. Thank you. Question about whether there are American expats living on the Galapagos? No, not, uh, not to my knowledge. Um, I, 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 that's possible that, uh, I mean, obviously a lot of the employment there centers around providing services to 
uh, to visitors, to tourists um, in hotels and restaurants and guiding, guiding services and, and running the boats and maintaining, servicing the boats. There may be some expats uh, who were able to get permission to live on one of the islands for a short period of time, but typically uh, it's restricted to uh, Ecuadorians who go to work there. Um, question about adaptation of species. Um, yeah, that's uh, the question is whether whether there has actually been observable uh, evolution essentially of species in the time that humans have been present or involved with the islands. Not that I'm aware of. Uh, evolution is a pretty long process and uh, there may be some minor behavioral modifications that have occurred perhaps in response to human presence but uh, nothing of a significance that would have broken off to form a, 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 a new and separate species. Uh, the nutrient that blue-footed boobies need to make their feet blue. Um, the, um, you know, I'm not entirely sure. I suspect it is in their plant uh, and insect food. But um, that's a very good question. Uh, I'll have to check that. I'm not sure. And uh, the color is uh, is it, well. It's it's genetically determined, but it's again it's uh, a a prevalence a preference for darker blue feet, depending on uh, the um, their genetic makeup, uh, which is then satisfied by their nutritional uh, by by the food that they are able to find. Um, not sure that answers that question, but that's something I will need to check on the nutrient that actually contributes to their feet being blue. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> are there any snakes on the island? There are not. There, were, there are no snakes on the islands. Just one other question is, how is tourism regulated? You might have already mentioned it. Yeah, so of course it's regulated by the licensing of the ships that allow, and, and the hotels that allow tourists to be there. And as you can imagine, there's tremendous controversy about the growth of tourism, which has expanded, as I say, more than tenfold uh, over the last several decades and fear about damaging this precious resource that they have. And so the approach that the Ecuadorian government has taken so far is to try to better manage uh, the number of tourists and to enforce regulations, although it's a large expanse of land. So they depend on the enforcement of regulations that is not to molest or bother or disrupt patterns of uh, the behavior of the uh, animals. They depend on the, uh, on the cruise ships uh, and, and their knowledge to, to um, police uh, the uh, tourists who they take on board because the Ecuadorian government certainly doesn't have enough uh, rangers to uh, patrol all of the activity of the tourists. So the, the ships themselves are responsible. And, and many of the people were on our cruise were reminded to keep a certain distance from the animals, to stay on certain trails, to not veer off of those trails uh, in terms of protecting the landscape. And they do a pretty good job of it. Their incentive, of course, is that if they uh, if uh, some of their uh, tourists uh, do um, violate regulations, they are in danger of losing their license. So they're very, very uh, vigilant about uh, keeping all of the their tourists in tow, uh, and that seems to work. Seems to work very well. Yet again, there is a constant question of whether they should do something to cap the number of tourists who can come. They haven't done that yet, uh, except uh, through the limit on the licensing of ships and hotels, but there is pressure to do that uh, as, for example, some places have begun, like for example, Machu Picchu in, in Peru, which has started to put a cap on the number of uh, tickets that are sold to enter that site. That seems to be with the growth of tourism, that seems to be a direction that many uh, world famous uh, attractions are heading towards. 
certainly COVID has, uh, has interrupted that uh, uh, substantially. It remains to be seen whether that will again uh, pick up once uh, things are back to a semblance of normal. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions at this time, um, again, I would like to thank Barry for this wonderful presentation. Um, I'm sure everyone here, I can speak for everyone here, they was, was great. Um, and that's it. Hopefully we'll have you back soon, Barry, maybe in the fall. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. Yes, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a, uh, a competition between uh, wanting to present some more of these programs and wanting to get back on the road uh, when I can. To, uh -huh. Put together, uh, to put together new programs and to uh, continue my travels, which have been, of course, uh, uh, severely disrupted with the, during this past year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, thank you. Well, I thank you all very much for attending, yeah. and uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again in a future program. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone.